just a second, the, the name of Jesus, the, the powerful name of Jesus. That's why we come together every week, to lift up the name of Jesus. I had the opportunity yesterday to preach a funeral. Thank you for a, a, someone, a, a lady who is almost, almost to the day exactly as old as I am. And it was this, uh, maybe one of the largest funerals I've ever preached. And um, the amazing amount of impact that her life had had and, and just the opportunity to share Jesus. I, I, just, I just want you to know that no matter what, what's uh, staring you in the face, is it death, is it disease, is it some circumstance, is it some relationship, is it a, a job situation, what, what, what is it? There's, there's nothing can, that can stand against the name of Jesus. There's nothing that can uh, have greater victory in your life than in Jesus. And so I just want to uh, pray for you one more time, that whatever it is you're facing this day before we get into the teaching, that you would just uh, trust in the name of Jesus, because that's, that's what we want to do this decade. We want to learn how to trust the Lord and do good. And so, so some of you just need today to trust. So let's just pray. God, I just thank you one more time for the ways that you're at work in this place. I thank you for the name of Jesus. I thank you that uh, we've already gotten a head start of what heaven's going to be like. The Lord tells us that there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God, we got to do that today. We don't have to wait till then. We, we did that today. And God, we just thank you for Jesus, for the life that he lived, for the death that he died, for the victory over the grave. We thank you that that victory carries over into our lives today. But God, I pray that for the one that's just facing something today, they would just take hope and courage and boldness in the name of Jesus. It's his name that we pray. Amen. Hey, we are uh, getting together, and we're gonna, I'm going to try uh, in just a few minutes to bring this uh, teaching series, Too Good to Be True, in for a landing. Uh, we'll talk about that as we, we get into that. But before we do that, just some things I, I want to uh, kind of put on your uh, calendars, if you aren't aware of, uh, this Wednesday night uh, in this room at 7 o'clock, believe it or not, uh, the Lenten season starts uh, this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, and so we're going to have Ash Wednesday service. It'll be about 45 minutes long. We'll start right at 7 o'clock and just encourage you to come and bring a friend as we uh, celebrate. And yes, uh, we've done it different ways, but yes, this year uh, there will be a time when we have the imposition of ashes, which I've told you before, and we'll talk a little bit on uh, Wednesday night. It becomes one of the hardest things for a, a minister to do, to just uh, look and say, uh, from Dust you came to dust you shall return, but it's a reminder that we all need. So Ash Wednesday, uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. If, you, if uh, you're able, Tuesday night this week, every Tuesday night at 6.30, we get together to pray right here in this room, Tuesday at 6.30. I just encourage you to come be a part of that. And then two weeks from today, I want to invite you to what we're going to call Pizza with the Pastors. Uh, Sunday night, March the 8th, two weeks from today, 6 o'clock, we're going to get together and we're just going to celebrate what God's done. It's hard to believe it's the last Sunday of February already, right? And some of you, I know, have taken me up on the challenge that you wanted to, to intake all of God's Word. And I, and I understand from some stories I've heard uh, this week that some of you have already finished, and I'm not going to call you out because everybody else in the room will despise you, and I don't want that to be part of your Sunday morning experience, but I just want you to keep going. I just want you to take in God's Word, to take it in, to take it in, to take it in. It's been a great journey. We're hearing great stories, and we're going to share some of those stories, and we're just going to celebrate uh, what God's doing. Uh, remember, we talked about, as, as we started this year, that too often we, we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in a decade. And, and I'm just praying that this decade will be different than any decade I've experienced in my spiritual life and for our church and not just for our church but for our world. Uh, those of you uh, who know, you know, uh, the, the 1920s were referred to as what? The Roaring 20s. Here's my prayer. I'm praying that the 2020s will be referred to spiritually as the Soaring 20s. That we will mount up with wings like eagles. That we will soar that we will do what God has intended for us to do, that we will step into our identities, that we fulfill his purpose, and that this decade we look back, if God would be so pleased that we get to the 2030s, like, good grief, look how far I've come in my spiritual journey, and look at the victory after victory, not just in my life, but in my family, and in our city, and in our state, and in our country, and in our world, that the name of Jesus would just be lifted up. And so, friends, I just think some amazing things are going to happen uh, this decade, so I just want to encourage you to come. Uh, pizza with the pastor, all you got to do is show up. Uh, we're just going to have some fun time. We're going to hear stories, and we're going to thank together and just praise God for the, for the victories that, that have been won. Some people have agreed to tell us part of their story, and we've got that on video. We'll be sharing, sharing that as well. Uh, just so you know, we're going to end this teaching series today and starting next week, next Sunday, Mar the first Sunday of March, going through the first Sunday of April, which is Palm Sunday, six weeks. 
Uh, we're going to be taking a look at a, at a teaching series. We're going to take a look at the last week of Jesus' life with a series that I'm just calling a finals week. A final week of his life. But in that week, there were some final things that took place. So next week, I'm going to kick the series off, and we're going to look at the final exam. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Praise God, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then Jesus uh, tells them you flunked the test. You gave all the praise, but you flunked the test. You didn't know the right answer to the question that matters most. And so we'll take a look at the final exam. Uh, two weeks uh, from today, uh, we're going to look at a, a sermon just called The Final Straw. It's Monday of that final week of Jesus' life where Jesus does a couple of things that seem out of character. Uh, he starts using a whip and turning over tables, and he curses a fig tree. Like, why does he do that? Seems like something happened. What was the final straw that led him to do those kind of things? And then on uh, March the 15th, uh, week three of this teaching series, asked Pastor Chris Carpenter to uh, take the Tuesday of Jesus' life and talk about uh, uh, the final countdown. Jesus starts talking about his second return. When's that going to happen and what you need to know and what you don't need to be concerned about? And he kind of paints this picture for us. So Pastor Chris Carpenter is going to do that. Uh, the fourth week, uh, Pastor Brian Underwood is going to do a, a sermon uh, called The Final Meal, as he takes a look at that Last Supper and takes a look at uh, something that happens there that's just fascinating. He's already shared with me some of his notes for that. It's just going to be spectacular. Uh, then uh, the last Sunday of March, Pastor Wooldridge is going to do a sermon uh, on the, the final words, the seven utter, utterings, the seven statements that Jesus utters from the cross on that Friday. And then uh, the, on Palm Sunday, I'm going to wrap that series up with a teaching just called uh, the, the Final Breath. The scripture says, with a loud cry, he breathed his last. Why was it important that Jesus die? And so I'm really excited about this series, and so I want to encourage you to, to gear up for it. Uh, maybe uh, you want to start reading one of the Gospels. Maybe you want to take in all of the Gospels. Maybe you're finishing up the Bible Challenge uh, this week, and you don't have anything else. What do I do next? Why don't you just start listening to the Gospels? I think there's a way to do it that you could listen to the Gospels 15 times through the, through the month of March and just kind of understand the story of Jesus. And if you want to do that, you can talk to me uh, more about that. Uh, at another time. And then uh, here's what we're going to do starting Easter Sunday. Because you've had such a great response to uh, this Bible challenge of taking it in, because we have to let it in, we have to let it root, we have to let it grow, because so many of you have done that. Uh, Pastor Wooldridge and I have taken on a challenge for ourselves uh, from Easter 2020 through Easter 2021. Uh, we're going to preach through the entire Bible. Like, there's no way you can do that in 52 weeks. You're right. We can't do it on 52 Sundays. So here's what's going to happen we're going to start preaching through the Bible from Easter to Easter. But one of the things that we're going to do, so for example, say, hey, we do a teaching on Sunday on the book of Genesis. What we're going to tell you is, hey, now on this Sunday you can go online and hear 10 other sermons, 10 other teachings on the book of Genesis. There will be all kinds of online content that you can binge watch and you can take it in, but uh, that's just what we want to do. And I'm going to share with you one other thing that God's put on my heart for us to do with the Word of God over the, over the next decade. But we're going to do that. In fact, I forgot to tell you, here's what we're calling that sermon series from Easter to Easter, Settled. Because uh, here's what God's word says, Psalm 119, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And, and I've heard the stories, so many people have come up to me and say, hey, Tim, I've been doing this, and, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I, I'm quite a worrier, and I try not to smile because I know they're a worrier. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that about you. And they're like, but I've been reading, I've been taking in God's word, and I'm not worrying nearly as much because here's what happens. God's word is settled in heaven. When it becomes settled in our hearts, our hearts become settled. It's just how the word of God works. And so we're going to do this from Easter to Easter with a series called Settled based on that verse out of uh, Psalm 119, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. And so I hope that you'll uh, invite uh, somebody to come and be a part of that. I'm so excited about where God's taken us in this next year and this next decade. Friends, I think this is going to be the soaring 20s in your spiritual life and my spiritual life and in the life of our church. So here's what I want to do. I want to address the online audience. So if you're in the room, I'm going to ask you to stand and greet one another. But instead of just saying hello, I need you to do something. I need you to, after you say hello... Give the person that you say hello to your definition of the word good. How do you define the word good? All right? How do you define the word good? Say hello to somebody. In the room, just stand up, greet one another, and I'm just going to say a word to the online audience. And to those of you watching online, thanks so much. You are such a huge part of Miami Valley Church, whether you're in the room or not. We love that you join us week in and week out. You could do us a huge favor by letting us know where you're watching from and, and how this ministers to you. If you're watching on Facebook, if you could just hit the like button, but make sure you hit the heart that says you love this, and then share it. And then in the comment section, if you would write just a quick comment, but it needs to be at least six words long. Just six words long. Maybe it's your definition of the word good. Maybe it's, uh, I'm watching from you know, Dayton, Ohio, USA, you know, whatever it is, just give me six words that helps us get this out in front of more and more people. 
And the teaching ahead, I may something, say something about those of you that are watching online, and I don't mean it to be offensive in any way. I just hope that you'll take it with the spirit of which is intended. It might not even apply to you. But thanks so much for joining us. Let us know you're watching, and let us know how God speaks to you today on your journey of trusting the Lord and doing good. It's my task today to kind of bring this teaching series in for a landing that Pastor Wooldridge has done such an incredible job these last two weeks, uh, taking us from Psalm 119 that says, uh, God, you're good and everything that you do is good. And, and he's just done an incredible job. I, I told him this after the first gathering last week. I watched online the week I was out with my dad. I was here in the room last week. And I don't know uh, if you appreciate this or not. What Pastor Wooldridge did last week with a Psalm 23 was, uh, the word I used with him was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant the way he took Psalm 23 and talked in it in terms of goodness and what you're going through now versus God's goodness. And I, I don't want you to miss that. If you didn't catch last week's sermon, you can find it on our YouTube channel if you are behind. But Pastor Wars just did such an incredible job and set the high bar for me to try to bring this thing in, in for a landing. And so it starts with this concept of good. And so I don't know how you define good, but it's, it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? How do you define good? I actually still have, because I'm old, a Merriam-Webster's dictionary on my shelf. It's that old red dictionary. You know, you guys, some of you my age, you had that old red dictionary. I pulled it off, and I looked up the word good, and I found 17 subsections. And each subsection had three to four definitions. So what, what's that like? That's like 50 to 60, almost 70 different definitions for the word good. How do you define it? And we use it in so many different ways. It's, uh, I, had a, I had a good day. You, you look good today. How Are you feeling good today? You know, you know and we use it in ways, oh, I went to the doctor. That was a good report, right? The weather's good today. Uh, maybe, maybe we use it in ways that I don't understand. Good grief. Mm, okay, maybe. Maybe, uh, for all I know. Uh, but, but we use this word. And, and going to the biblical words doesn't help much either. Because throughout the Old Testament, ma- written in Hebrew, the New Testament written mainly in Greek, there's so many different words it means so many different things. In fact, if you just pull a concordance off your Bible, it lists all the places different words occur. The word good and goodness in my concordance show up 619 times. And it means so many different things. And it's so important because so many of us think about this. We, we think about it, and I need to know good because I want to be good enough to get to the good place. I, I want to be good enough to have a good life. So in order for us to get through this, I, I need to talk to you about goodness, what it's not, what it is, what's the problem, what's the plan, what, what God has in store for us. And then I, at the end, I kind of want to wrap this up and give you five real practical things that you can do to develop goodness in your life. But, but here's, here's what good is not. It's not feeling good, looking good, or having all the goodies. And so many people, that's how they define the good life. I, I'm a good person if I can feel good, if I can, if I can look good, and if I'm not feeling good or I'm not looking good or I don't have all the goods, I don't have all the goodies, then I'm missing out on something. And if God hasn't given me those three things, then, then I'm never going to have the good life. But that's not what good or goodness is in God's opinion. So that's what it's not. But what is it? Best I can tell, if you go to the Scriptures, the first time the word good is used is in, in Genesis chapter 1. You remember the story of creation, and God said, and it was so, and he pronounced it good. God said it was so, and it was good. And God said, and it was so, and it was good. And God said, and it was so, and it was good. Six times, six days, that happens, and God pronounces things good. So the best I understand it, at the beginning, goodness equals this. When something or someone is fulfilling the purpose for which it was created. But God looks at the sun and the moon and the stars and it pronounces it good because they're fulfilling the purpose for which it was created. Looks at the trees and the shrubs and the, all the plants and the vegetation and, they're, and they're, they're bearing fruit and it was good. He looks at human, it was good. When someone or something is fulfilling the purpose for which it was created, that's good. And so the question comes, are we fulfilling the purpose for which we were created? Like, Tim, I don't know what that is. Let me simplify it for you. God has told us what your purpose is and what my purpose is. And here it is, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. God has made us what we are. In Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, living, 
for us to live our lives doing. Your purpose and my purpose is to do good works. But let me be very clear. I said this in the funeral that I preached yesterday. And of all the people and all the funerals I've ever done, this, this, this lady who had, had passed away had done so much good in her life, and the people, uh, this, this room was packed out. But I, but, I, but I said in the midst of that that you, you need to understand that God didn't love her because he was good. God loved her because God's good. And in his goodness, he has prepared uh, good works for us to do. And when we're doing those good works, we're, we're living out his purpose. But please don't misunderstand. Uh, we are not saved by good works. We're saved for good works. Good works do not save you. Doing enough good things will not get you to heaven. Good, doing enough good things will not get you to the good place. Doing enough good things will not earn you God's good favor. It's not saved by good work. We're saved for good work. And so this is what God wants. God wants us to fulfill. He's prepared works for you and me to do, good things for you and I to do, but there's a problem. By ourselves, we can't do them. We just can't do them. I'm getting older, crankier, and feel like I have less time for debate sometimes. And one of the things... I said it yesterday when I said uh, God did not love this precious lady because she was good, but because he was good, and, and her goodness did not get her into heaven. I had several people come up after the service like, I don't like what you said. Can you answer a question to me? I'm not sure, I'll, I'll try. And the question which you've heard and maybe you've gotten as a follower of Jesus is, why do bad things happen to good people? And I'm older and I'm crankier. And I don't have time for that discussion most of the time anymore. And so when they asked me, and yes, it's in a sensitive environment, and they asked why do bad things happen to good people, my answer was they don't. Bad things don't happen to good people because there are no good people. There are no good people. I don't know everything about you, but I know this, you're not good. You don't know everything about me, but you ought to know this about me, I'm not good. In fact, Jesus said it this way. Jesus was on one occasion called good teacher, and look what his answer was. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. And so, let's just be honest with one another. You're not God. I'm not God, so you're not good. Despite, have you seen this thing in the news that just blown me away? This guy that was from Ohio and he's moved to Kentucky and he sued the state of Kentucky to be able to have on his license plate, I'm God. He had it in Ohio, I'm God, and he went to Kentucky, moved to Kentucky, and Kentucky said no because they said it was obscene, and he sued the state of Kentucky, and he got the right to put I'm God on his license plate, and he won $150,000 in the lawsuit. And I got really bad news for him. He's not God. No matter how much you proclaim it. I'm not God no matter how much. No matter how much I jump up and down and say I'm good, it's just not true. I believe that there are no good people because the Bible says it. Secondly, I believe there are no good people because history confirms it. You do not have to look past much history than yesterday's news. And uh, a caucus that took place out west. Pick your cable news of choice, and you're going to hear an awful lot of evidence that people just aren't good. There's evil, there's hatred, whatever side you fall on, you pick your cable news network of choice, and there's just hatred and things that shouldn't exist, and people just aren't good. The Bible says it, history confirms it. The third reason I don't believe that there are any good people is because I'm a parent. I had three daughters, and I love them with all of my heart, but I did not have to teach any of them to lie. I did not have to teach any of them to be selfish. I did not have to teach any of them to uh, try to settle things with arguments with their sister. They learned that independent of me because in and of themselves, as much as I love them, they are not good. The fourth reason, though, that most importantly to me, the reason I don't believe there are any good people is because I know me in my heart. I stand in line with the Apostle Paul who wrote on one occasion, it is a trustworthy saying deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm at the top of the list. I know my heart. And on days when, as a pastor, you're supposed to go out and you're supposed to do good, I just don't want to do good. On the days when you want to go out and you just don't want to have that conversation, I, I just don't want to, and I have to push past that, and I know my own heart, and so I think we just have to come to the conclusion there are no good people. And this is what uh, God's Word says in Jeremiah chapter 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard take away its spots? Neither can you start doing good who are accustomed to doing evil. That's a problem. God's prepared in advance good works for me to do, and I don't have it in and of myself, the ability to do it, because I'm just not a good person. What in the world do you do at that point? 
you have to pray a prayer. And it's a prayer that started this series that Pastor Wilder has been talking to you about the last two weeks. It comes from Psalm 119. Here's the prayer. The prayer simply says, God, you are good and what you do is good. Train me in your goodness. God, I can't do good on my own. I need to be trained in how to do good things because in and of myself, I just can't get them done. Here's the deal, friend. God, when we ask him, will give you the desire to be good and the power to do good. But in and of yourself, you can't do it because it's just not in you, but it is in God, the only one who is ever good. God's at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So then that's the problem. There's a, there's a desire, but, but here's the plan. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. Four verses. Galatians 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And verse 10 simply says, you do good to all people. <laughs> Does anybody else see a problem here? God's prepared works for me to do. I'm not equipped to do them. I'm not prepared to do them. In and of myself, I can't do them. But he doesn't let me off the hook. He says, you have to go do good works. Question for some of you. Uh, how many of you either now or maybe growing up had like a vegetable garden that you took advantage of? And, and anybody, can I see your hands? I, I see some of you. How many of you have a friend that has a vegetable garden and you hope with all hope that they bring you goodies out of their vegetable garden, right? Why don't you, while I get a drink of water, why don't you uh, turn and tell somebody next to you, hey, this is what I like for my vegetable garden or what I hope somebody brings me uh, this summer when the vegetable gardens come in. So go ahead. If you're watching online, let me know what you're looking forward to to get out of your garden. So you have this desire and you have this thing, but uh, if you can grab a hold of this, this concept that you've already shared, you already know it, but if you can grab a hold of this concept and, and understand it, you've got uh, three quarters of today's sermon, just, you, you got it, you got it down. You, you know the truth. Autumn and I uh, have planted some things over the course of the years and it's time to go out and, and get the seeds, and so we just recently, uh, we went out and we got the seeds, and we're excited to, to begin the planting process, but, but, but check this out. Um, I've got a hunch that uh, you don't go, we don't go to the store and say, uh, what do we want to plant? We go saying, what do we want to eat? And what we want to eat from our garden is homemade sauce. And we are heavily, rel heavily reliant on Dick Fultz to bring us tomatoes from his garden every summer so that we can make. We cannot grow a tomato to save our lives. So if you grow gar tomatoes in your garden, please, Tim and Autumn would like to be on your list of recipients of your tomatoes. But, but we, we do grow uh, peppers, uh, we do grow onions, and we do grow cilantro because you need all of those ingredients because we know what we want to eat. There, there's a basic relationship, right? You, you know it in the world of gardening. There's a basic relationship between what you plant and what you pick. You pick what you plant. And some of you need to learn that scripture and get your mind around that spiritually. Listen to Galatians chapter 6, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. It's not going to be on the screen, but just listen. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Ox translation? You pick what you plant. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Galatians 6. What do we have here? We've got a letter that was written to a group of churches in a region called Galatia. And actually, we're just looking at a snippet. We're looking at a fragment of the letter, what we call chapter 6, just four verses towards the end of the letter out of chapter 6. But it wasn't written to one church. It was written to a region of churches. The Apostle Paul, who writes this as he goes around the ancient world planting pockets of Jesus communities, takes three missionary journeys. And in all three of them, he finds a way to get to this region of the world. Here it is on a map. Um, you see the boot of Italy, and you just kind of kind of go east, and you find uh, the red, big red dot. That's modern-day Turkey. This is the region of Galatia in the Bible. Uh, next map shows you a little more detail. Paul's going to leave just north of Jerusalem from Syria and Antioch. He's going to sail to Cyprus. He's going to then go up to the region. It goes to Perga. Perga's not in the region of Galatia, but four cities, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. 
Paul's going to go to all four of those cities on all, four, on all three of his missionary journeys. And when he writes to the churches of Galatia, these are the cities he's writing to. And they're going through some things that we don't go through. And so part of the book of Galatians is like, ah, I listen to it and it doesn't make sense because, because there's a struggle. Part of the struggle going on in the ancient world when Paul's writing to them is there, there are Jewish Christians and there are Gentile Christians. And the Jewish Christians come up with this opinion that, that you can't really be a, a, a Christian unless you adopt the, the Jewish customs. And so unless you go through all the, uh, kind of eat the food they eat and males go through circumcision. If you don't go through all the Jews, you can't really be Christian. So they ask the question, can you be a Christian without being Jewish? Paul's going to answer that, and we don't really have that uh, discussion uh, these days, but Paul then turns it, and by the time you get to chapter 6, he's using farmer's language. And if you ever go to this region of Galatia, and you ever go to one of these cities that most of them are just uh, big hills now, they still haven't been excavated, and you stand out and you look all around you, you're just going to see field after field after field after field after field. Paul's talking to a, to a group of farmers, and he's, he's like, don't, don't be deceived, God can't be mocked. You, you know this. You, you reap what you sow, you, you pick what you plant. And, and so he begins to talk about this. I just want to share with you three things real quickly, but before I do, I, I just want to ask you, what do you want to grow in this season of your life? What, what, is it that you, what is it that you want the outcome to be? What, what are you doing to ensure that that happens? Because you... you, you, you Pick what you plant, and, and all of you are planting something. And, and I say it this way, we'll talk more detail, but, but if, if right now what you're, what you're reaping in your life is, is hatred and bitterness and jealousy and envy, it's because somewhere back here, that's what you planted. And, and you haven't done what needed to be done to get rid of that. And, and if you don't want to continue to reap hatred and jealousy and bitterness and envy, you need to start planting something else. What is it, what is it that you want to reap? What is it that you want to pick? It's like we want salsa. So we plant the right things to get salsa? But what is it that you want? Because you, you pick what you plant. And that's very simply the, the first truth from verse 7 and 8. You, it's the law of the harvest. You, you, you pick what you plant. You pick what you plant. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. Don't think otherwise. If you're looking for something else, it'd be silly for me to want salsa and say, I need some fresh-grown peppers and not plant any peppers, but plant a head of lettuce and hope that they turn out to be peppers. Or to plant some grapefruit and hope that it turns out to be onions. It's silly. And some of you are waiting for God to do this miraculous thing in your life to produce all of these things inside of you, and you haven't planted what's been needed to be planted and tended and cultivated. You will pick what you plant. Then he says this, verse 8. You've got a choice. Whoever sows to please their flesh will from the flesh reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. He's like, two fields. You get to choose where you plant. And if you're planting over here in this field that, that's, that's destruction and you plant to please yourself and plant all these selfish desires, you're going to reap things that lead to destruction. But if you plant over here in this field, the, the field of the Spirit that you live to please God, you're going to produce some things that only the Spirit of God can produce in your life. Well, where, where are you planting? Do not be deceived. It's the law of the harvest. You pick what you plant. Paul does this amazing thing as he writes the letter to Galatians. This is chapter 6. But in the previous chapter, chapter 5, any of you ever heard of the, heard of the phrase, the fruit of the Spirit? Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. That's in Galatians chapter 5. He talks about things that God wants to produce in your life. But he really gives us two lists. He gives us the list of the fruit that's planted in the field of destruction. He gives us the list of the fruit that's planted in the field of the Spirit. Galatians 5, here's the first list. When you follow the desire of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and don't miss this, other sins like these. This is not an exhaustive list. He just says, hey, if there are some of the things that you've been planting and this is what you're reaping, it's the law of the harvest. You, you, you pick what you plant. Then he gives us another list. Look at the next list. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Like one of the lists better than the others? I do. I want this list to be a reality in my life. The Holy Spirit's going to produce it, but it involves some planting. And it involves some time. 
Here's what I want to do, real quick. I want to go back to the first law. I want you to be honest with you and God right now, nobody else. You're watching behind a screen with some other people in the room, just you and God, nobody else. You're in the room, you're seated next to a spouse, you're seated, seated next to a child, you're seated next to a friend, you're seated next to a stranger. Nobody else, just you and God, you and God, you and God. Here's a question. In this season of your life, is this the fruit that your life is bearing? Look at the list. I, I would submit to you that everything on this list is a God-given desire gone bad. Sexual immorality. In his image, male and female, you have been created. And one of the things that he has given you is a strong sense of sexuality and sexual desires. But he's also said sexuality is to be lived out within the confines of marriage. And it gets distorted. Mm. Sorcery. Some of your translations say witchcraft. Scriptures say that God has planted in you the desire to know it. God's planted eternity in your heart. You want to know the supernatural. You want to know all those kinds of things. But when it turns to the tarot cards and, a, and a astrological forecasts, it's, it's twisted. You're relying that on more than the Spirit of God. Drunkenness. God has created everything. Uh, uh, for us to be enjoyed, but when it becomes anything, becomes addictive. And I think we could probably go around the room and we could hear testimony after testimony of how drunkenness and how addiction has led to pain in personal lives and family lives and has caused pain to all kinds of other people around you. But just you and God, no judgment here, just you and God. Is there in this season of your life any of this that's being the fruit that you're bearing? And if it is, it's because you planted something wrong back here. Because you pick what you plant. If it is, by the way, some of you, none of those are on my list, and other sins like these. Any fruit in your life that is being, uh, that you're bearing right now that shouldn't be there that's not honoring to God. Ascension, division. Proverbs chapter 6 says this, there are six things that God hates, seven that are detestable to him. One of the things it says is detestable to God, the person that sows discord among the brothers. Sows division that sows strife. Anything in your life on this list or anywhere else that's fruit you no longer want to produce? If so, here's what you do with it. You just get honest with God and you confess it. Say, hey, God, yeah, selfish ambition. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. What is there? Hostility, anger. God, I, I'm sorry. Here's what the scripture says. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Friends, you don't have to live defeated by your past. You don't have to allow this to be the only fruit that your life produces. It can change and it can change now, but it starts with confession. You and God, God forgive me for. Next list. Just you and God. Do you need to say, hey God, truth be told right now, I'm not very loving. Truth be told, school teacher, kids are ready to be done. I'm growing very impatient. I just need some patience. Uh, may, maybe, maybe your parent, and you're struggling with a kid, and you're like, I just don't want to see their face right now. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I don't know uh, how I'm going to keep putting up with this, with this rebellion. I, I just don't know. God, I'm not very patient. I'm not very loving. Uh, I, I don't have much kindness towards them. God, any, anything on this list that you just need to pray, okay, God, uh, I need to plant some of those seeds and I need you to infuse my life with patience. I need your spirit to produce. Interesting to me that that's what it says. The Holy Spirit produces. I don't see that he does the planting. I think it starts with us. Hey, God, I want to be more loving. God, I need to be more patient. And we start to plant those seeds and he's going to produce that. So anything you need to confess, Anything you need to just ask God for, would you take a moment while I pray and do that? God, I just pray in this moment we'd be honest. Nobody else looking, nobody else paying attention. God, that we'd just be honest with you. Father, help us. Forgive our sins. God, I just ask that you would, those things that are bearing fruit that aren't pleasing to you, God, that you would just remove it. We'd stop planting those seeds and that we'd start planting the seeds of the kind of fruit that you want to produce. God, we get it, we, we plant what we pick. We want to start planting the right things. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If there's something on either one of those lists that you'd like help with, you can just let it let us know. You can write a, tell us online. You can put it on the card. Just talk to us. Pastor Wilder and I be hanging around. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you, even get with you this week. Law of the harvest. You pick what you plant. Second thing from verse 9 is this. You never harvest in the same season you plant. I don't like this one. You never harvest in the same season you plant. Verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. At the proper time, at the proper time. Reminds me of Psalm 1. It says, the person who's blessed meditates on, the day, meditates on his law day and night, and he'll be like a tree planted by the river's water, which brings forth fruit in its season. You know what that means? It means if you plant when you're supposed to plant, you're going to pick when you need the harvest to come. When you need patience, it's going to be there because you planted the seeds. When you need goodness to be there, it's going to be there because you planted the seeds. You will reap a harvest in due season, but you never harvest in the same season you land. I don't like these words, at the proper time. It doesn't just happen like this. You never harvest in the same season you plant. Harvesting, planting and harvesting is a little bit of work. Here's four quick pictures. You've got to till the soil. Maybe some of the toil of your heart needs to be, some of the soil of your heart needs to be tilled up, needs to be softened up a little bit so the seed of God's word can get in. After you do this, then weather happens and stuff starts to grow. It starts to sprout. And you're like, oh yes, it's going to look like it's going to be a good harvest. It looks like it's going to be a good crop. And then you need to wait a little more, a little longer. And then, oh yes, I can't wait. But, but what happens if you pick too soon? You don't get to enjoy the, the fruit of your labor, right? You got to wait till the fruit's on the vine. And so it's just this process. And you do not harvest in the same season that you plant. And we go to the store and we get seeds. And it frustrates me to no end because on the back of these seeds, there is a little line and it says days to harvest. And not one single one of them says zero. They all say something along the lines of 65 to 85. And I don't know about you, but when I know God wants me to do something and I plant a seed, I'm like, I want the harvest now, thank you. I want the harvest now. And how many of you have ever said or heard people say, don't ever ask God for patience because he's going to give you plenty of opportunities because you plant a seed and he brings opportunities for you to learn how to be patient. You learn how to be patient. But you don't harvest in the same season that you plant. Because we want the harvest now. The 15-year-old boy who lives at home with his mom, his dad's not around. Dad's never been part of his life. And he and mom don't have a very good relationship. In fact, if you were to ask him, he would tell you, my mom's never said one positive word to me in all of my life. All I hear from her is, I get up, I fix my own breakfast, I go to school, I come home, I do my homework, I start playing my games, and the only thing I ever hear from my mom is, you're a loser just like your dad, you'll never amount to anything, you never lift a finger around here to help me. I only get negative, that's what he would say. And so one day he comes home and he decides, I'm going to do something different. He said, I'm going to come home, I'm going to do my homework, before mom gets home at four o'clock, I'm going to clean up the house, and he vacuums the house, and he uh, does the dishes, and he takes out the trash, and he straightens up the magazines and he makes them look good and here's the garage door open and here comes mom into the house. He runs back to his computer seat because he wants mom to think it's just like any other day. He walks in and obviously she can tell that the house has been cleaned, the dishes have been done, the trash has been taken out and she just kind of looks and she comes to his desk and looks at him and is like, it's about time but you're still a loser just like your father. You'll never amount to anything. One day doesn't change a thing and all of a sudden this young man faced with a decision what is he going to say to his mother? Because you see, when you're hurt, natural reaction, because you're not good, I'm going to hurt you more. And I know exactly what it is I could say to you to put you in your place, old lady. I could call you old lady, and I could tell you, no wonder dad left you. And he's got a decision to make. What's he going to plant in this season of his life? And he chooses not to say anything. He chooses to just sit there and take it and not say anything. And it doesn't change mom. How long is he going to continue to good? He needs to plant those now because, you know what, there's a really good chance that when he's 22 and he's working a job at the customer service counter, there's going to be a customer that comes up and complains about the job that somebody else in the company did and he's going to take the grief for it. And if all he's planted is seeds of hatred and envy and bitterness and I'll make you feel worse than I feel, he's going to lash out at that customer and it's going to cost him his job. He's going to be 28 and he's going to be married now. And his wife has done nothing but support him and encourage him and make him feel valuable and special. But one day she has a really bad day and she comes home and the house isn't clean. And he didn't do what he was supposed to do and she lets him have it. And he has a choice. And the way he's going to react at 28 comes to the seeds he planted when he was 15. 
And now he's 32, and he's moving into a manager's job, and he doesn't know how to manage because every manager and every boss that he's ever had has only spoken negative things and him, has never said one word of praise, and he has to figure it out. What's going to come out of his heart when he's 15, when he's 22, when he's 28, and when he's 32? Whatever he planted here. Some of you are thinking, okay, Tim, well, how long does he have to put up with the mom who's not supportive? Wrong question. This isn't about the mom. This is about what's going on in that 15-year-old boy's heart and what he plants now. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying uh, that he's going to get it right all the time. But I just want you to know, you pick what you plant, and God says it's not going to happen in the same season that you plant it. Do not grow weary from 15 to 22 to 28 to 32. Don't grow weary in doing good because you will reap a harvest if you don't quit. And I just encourage you, never allow someone else's lack of goodness to keep you from being good. You see, if this young man said that the good things that he did was dependent on his mom's goodness, on the customer's goodness, on the spouse's goodness, or on the boss's goodness, he'd never do a single good thing in his life. The only way he can do good things if his goodness isn't dependent on his mom's goodness, his spouse's goodness, his customer's goodness, or the boss's goodness. The only way he does good things is if his goodness is dependent on God's goodness. And God loves us because he's good, not because we're good. I need to go quickly, so strap in, here we go. What are you planning in this season of life? What if? God didn't say verse 10, he just says, now I want you to go good. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Therefore, as we have opportunity, as we have opportunity, as we have opportunity, what's that mean? What's that mean? You have a snow shovel and a strong back and your neighbor doesn't, go shovel their lawn, go shovel their, their snow. You have a surplus of cash and your neighbor has an empty pantry, an, an empty pantry, put some groceries in their refrigerator. You've got a neighbor who doesn't have a godly male role model in their life. Find some way to pour into that young man's life. You have extra coats in your closet and they have none. As you have opportunity, do good. What if, what if goodness is achieved not by one act of greatness, but by a whole bunch of acts of goodness done time after time after time after time after time? Do not grow weary in doing good. Time after time after time after time. I think that's how it happened. Be the mature one. Be the first to say, I'm sorry. Don't wait for somebody else. Be the one to serve in the nursery every week. Be the one to go over and above. Teenagers. Did you see in that list, um, wild parties? Know which party you need to leave and know which party you don't need to go to to start with. Adults, did you see in that list wild parties? Know which party you need to leave and know which party you don't need to go to to start with. Over and over and over, what are you planting? But there's a learning curve. Five things real quick, and I'm going to fly through these. Five things real quick. Here's what Paul writes to a young man named Titus. He says, our people must learn to do good so that their lives will be fruitful. Check that out. We have to learn to do good. God, teach me your goodness. Train me in the ways of your goodness. But, but I need to learn to do good. How can I learn to do good? Five things. Five things if you want to learn to do good. Number one, uh, hear God's word. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. It's why we're encouraging to take it in. It's why we're encouraging to spend time with it. It's why we're encouraging to, to go deeper. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God. It's useful to teach us what's true, make us realize what's wrong, straightens us out, helps us to do what is right. It's God's way of making us well prepared. Remember, he's prepared good work, works for you to do. Now you've got to get prepared to do them. How do you get prepared? Through his word. That's why my heart is thrilled that so many of you took me up on this challenge uh, to go through February and take all of God's word. My heart was thrilled that Thursday night, uh, Wednesday night, um, 37 ladies are gathering here every Wednesday night for Bible study just to know more of God's word. It's why I just want to encourage you. And here's, here's my promise to you. As much as I can make a promise, as long as God chooses to give me breath and, and allow me to be a, a leader in Miami Valley Church. Because I, I want this to be the soaring 20s and it comes with you and I understanding God's word together. I have a conviction that over this decade, for those who are part of Miami Valley Church, by the time 2030 hits, we want to have provided you an opportunity to experience free of charge 
a master's level theological education. We want to teach you the God, God's word in depth so much over this next decade that you will have a better understanding of God's word than you've ever had it before. We have some amazing Bible teachers in our church family, and we're going to find ways to do that. We want you to know God's word. We want you to let it in. We want you to let it root. We want you to let it go. We want you to hear it. We want you to memorize it. We want you to meditate on it. We want you to be, watch it produce its fruit in your life, that you'll be like the, the person uh, that, that brings forth fruit in its season, that that's what God wants you to do, and it starts with honoring God's word. If you're looking for something to do in March, you say, Tim, I didn't get through the, the Bible in a year. If I, I, I just, I'm just looking for something to do. If you're looking for something to do in March, listen to the Gospels all the way through. Here, here's what you could do. Matthew and Mark total 44 chapters. So you could listen in a day to 44 chapters. Luke and John, total 45 chapters. So if you're in this discipline, hey, I, I did it. You, you, can take, you can take it in 15 times during the month of March, just the Gospels as we get to, ready to engage the story. Learn God's Word as part of the learning curve. Secondly, guard your mind. What is it that you're really letting in? I, I really have enjoyed the stories that I've heard of people say, hey, I started listening to God's Word while I was on the treadmill, and, and that's just what I'm going to keep listening to. And that other stuff that I was listening to, that's just filling my mind with the wrong things. This is what Philippians 4 says. In conclusion, my friends, fill your mind with those things that are good. God's word is good. Things that are deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Think about those things. But warning, I'm sorry, um, guard your mind. Third, uh, strengthen your convictions. Strengthen your convictions. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Don't hate the person who's doing evil, hate what is evil. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And God, right? God is good, so we want to we want to cling to God. We strengthen our convictions. Goodness demands some gutsy convictions. Goodness demands some gutsy convictions. What are the convictions? They say, these, I will not sway from these. But when you make some gutsy convictions and you choose to do good, oh, here's the warning. It will cost you. First Peter 2.20. Not going to be on the screen, just listen. What, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? If you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps, which includes suffering for doing good. It will cost you. If you want God to produce fruit of goodness in your life, it's going to cost you. Fourth, imitate your master. Imitate your master. Do not imitate what is evil. Imitate what is good. Who's good, God? Imitate what Jesus did, the life that he lived. Imitate your master. And then finally, no, not finally, Fifthly, increase your circle. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Friends, you need to stop just coming to church on Sunday. You need to get involved with a small group of believers who are developing strong convictions, who want to do good, who want to live their lives that way. You need to put yourself in that environment every single week. For those of you that are watching online, I know some of you are watching online because it's um, It's convenient. Some of you are watching online, you're kind of checking our church out. We have way more people watch online for about four to six weeks before they ever come through the door. I get that. But if you're simply watching online because it's more convenient than being in the house of God, you need to rethink what you're doing. And in addition, if you're watching online and that's what, what works for you, are you every week around a group of people? Do not forsake uh, the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. Not giving up meeting together. I learned it from the King James. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't do it. Put yourselves around other people who can challenge you. Because I can encourage you to read the Bible and listen to the Bible during the month of February. But if you're in a group, the people that are challenged, you can report to them and be held accountable. Enlarge your circle. And then finally, would you please understand that this idea about being good and doing good really isn't about you. It's about God and others. Look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. When they see you doing good, like, why do you do that? Well, let me tell you, in and of myself, I can't. Because <laughs> I know my heart. And it's hard. This is what God's doing in me. I did this because I wanted you to see God. And when you do that, they will see God. And they, they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Friends, where does this hit you this week? God, you are good, and everything you do is good. Train me in your goodness. Jesus, if you would be so pleased, may you drive this 
deeply into the soul of our heart. Grow good in us. May we change minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week. Help us get intentional about what we're planting today so that we can enjoy the fruit of goodness later. Help us not to grow weary and help us find a way to do good this week. Father, for the one who's never trusted in your goodness, who's never trusted that you alone are good, may they call out to you through the name of Jesus and trust you in a new work in their life. Father, may this become in my life, in the life of my family, in the life of all who are listening, in the life of our church, may this truly become the soaring 20s. Our spiritual lives would never be the same because we decided today this is what we're going to see planted so that at the end, fruit that only you can produce would amaze us. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey, before you get out of here, uh, just a word, and I, I do this only because so many have asked and asked after the, have asked me, hey, Tim, where are you at in the, uh, in the challenge? I, you can direct all your uh, despisement towards me. Um, I had a chance, some of you know this, a couple of weeks ago, uh, got, got some unsettling news and needed to go back to Missouri. Uh, my dad had a biopsy, and so I went back for that test, and the results have come back great. There's still a couple of things that the, that the doctors are looking at. But in the course of going out there, I spent uh, a little over 24 hours in the car <laughs> uh, because of weather and that kind of stuff. And all I did was listen. And the other thing is my dad's in bed every night by 8.30. And so I had all kinds of time in the evening to do what I wanted. So I just chose to do that. So uh, I finished up my February time through the, gospel, or through the, through the Bible on uh, February the 16th. And I've started again. And so I, I'm just trying, to, I don't think I'm going to make it all the way through a second time. But friends, I am just amazed in my own heart when I take it in, when I take it in, when I take it in, when that's what I'm filling my mind, when I fill my mind with that good, how it changes me, how it changes my outlook, and how it changes my perspective of everything in front of me. So just let me encourage you, get involved in God's word. One of our teenagers told me this morning, hey, Pastor Tim, that hey, uh, I'm, I'm not doing it that way, but I want you to know I'm, I'm taking in a chapter of God's word every day, and my heart was thrilled more than they've taken in in a long time, maybe ever. So just let it in, let it root, let it grow. I'll be hanging around down front if there's some way we can help you. Uh, thanks for your patience today. I'll bring a friend back with you next week as we start this series, uh, Finals Week, and we look at the final exam. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week.